we celebrate the birth of the Lord. And of course, there's always some one individual who wants to debate and, or, you know, say, well, you know, he probably was born in September or not in December, and they want to make that kind of an issue, but you know what? I don't care if it's December or February or a I'm just glad he came into this world. And this is what the record says about the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Luke talking, he gives the longest account about the birth of Jesus Christ. And this whole chapter takes in 52 verses, but I'm just going to read 20 of them. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one, into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was, that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came up, up on them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angels a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things which they had heard and seen as it, were told, as it was told unto them. We have before us, as Brother Charlie brought out in the Sunday school lesson, he made a comment briefly about it, but we have before us the greatest of all stories. The story about how our Lord was born into this life. And Luke begins by stating that in those days that Caesar ruled all the earth. Now this Caesar that rules all the earth, he's, his name is really Gaius or Gaius Octavian. He was the great nephew of Julius Caesar. He ruled from 26 B.C. down to 14 A.D. And he was a born fighter. He clawed his way to the top. In 31 B.C. in the Battle of Actium, he defeats Mark Antony and Cleopatra and becomes the sole power of the Roman Empire. He is the President of the United States, and that would be his equivalent. He, was, he is the most powerful man in the world at that time. 
He is the first Caesar to be called Augustus. And he was given that title by the Roman Senate. Now that name Augustus had before that time always been given unto gods. And so we're beginning to see the beginning of Caesar worship as a god. So they're seeing the emperor as a god now. Fact is, the name Augustus means holy, uh, reverend, and so on. And only one is truly holy, and that's Jesus Christ. The one whose birth we're about to celebrate. The fact is, Greek cities so admired Octavian Caesar, Augustus Caesar, that they adopted his birthday as the beginning of the new year, the first day of the new year. And they hailed him as the Savior. So Luke is contrasting the one who has the title of Savior, and then he's saying, but here's the true Savior. The little child born in Bethlehem in fulfillment to Micah's prophecy in Micah 5 and 2. And you would think that Octavian Caesar, as far, you'd think he was a really great guy. I mean, he, after all, did create the Pax Romana. This 200 years of peace, but I want you to understand about that peace that it was a Hitler's peace. You didn't dare say anything against the Caesar, you know, against the emperor. You didn't dare say anything against the Roman government. It was your life if you did. So it was not a democracy. When Octavian died, men comforted themselves by saying, well, he's not really a dead because a god cannot die. And so, Luke goes on in this chapter to talk about this relentless power of, of Caesar, how his relentless arm had stretched across the Mediterranean into Palestine, and he's going to tax all the earth. He's going to squeeze tribute from them as much as possible that every tiny little village had to pay their taxes. And they did this through a census. Now, a census in the Roman government took place every 14 years. And there were two reasons for the census. One was to fi find out what young men had reached the age of military service. But Jewish men were exempt from serving in the military. So the purpose then for the Jews was simply taxation. And Mary, being of the, child, of the lineage of David through Nathan, had to go down to Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a name which means city of bread. And so Jesus actually, in one of the places where he had these seven statements, I am the door and I am the good shepherd. And these seven statements shows the relationship of Christ and the church. One of them, he says, I am the bread of life in John chapter 6. And it's interesting that he was born in the city of Bethlehem, which means city of bread. But it's also called the city of David. Joseph being through a different line of David's descendants also had to so both Mary and Joseph were through, through the line of David. So therefore they had to go into Bethlehem to be taxed. That was their home city. And so from where they were going down to Bethlehem was a trip of 80 miles. Riding on the back of this little beast. And here Mary is ready to be delivered. She is full term. And so while she's there, the days come to pass, the time comes to pass that uh, she has to be, you know, she's to deliver this baby. And Mary and, and Joseph look like insignificant nobodies. 
They appear to be helpless pawns caught in this great movement of history. But Luke is trying to point out that whereas the world will look upon Octavian as the savior of the world and, and so on, the true God was born in Bethlehem and took on the nature of man. And so in verses 6 and 7, he deals with what is called the incarnation. It says in verses 6 and 7, And so it was that while they were there, the days were confident that she should be delivered. She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. By the way, it says firstborn son. What's your matter? You wouldn't say firstborn son. If, if, if this was the only child she ever had, then you'd say her, her only son. But because it says her firstborn son, then you automatically have to infer that she had other children later. And when we studied the book of Mark, in Mark chapter, I think it's Mark chapter 6, maybe it's 4 or 6, but anyway, it's over in the book of Mark, they're listing the other children that Mary had. And so I know that there, uh, there's this group of people who hold Mary as almost like co-redeemer, uh, but that's not what the Bible says. And in fact, in, in, in this chapter 1, Mary is, has what is called the Magnificat, and she's praising God. And uh, in that praising of God, I believe it's in chapter 2. Anyway, uh, she talks about Jesus being her Savior. So it means that she, if she's con confessing that Jesus is her Savior, she's confessing that she needed a Savior, that she'd said, you see. She's not the sinless person. The Bible does not depict her in that, the way that this one large denomination depicts her as being the sinless mother of God. Nevertheless, He's talking about the incarnation. Mary was very young. I would estimate her somewhere being around 13, maybe 16 years of age, somewhere like that. And she's made this long journey to Bethlehem. Bethlehem, uh, when the Micah's, uh, when Micah made that prophecy in Micah 5, 2, there were two Bethlehems. And he wanted to clarify which one it was. He says, Bethlehem Ephrata, meaning the smallest one of the two. And so, I would imagine that people, if they came to Spencer, West Virginia, if they came to Arnoldsburg, West Virginia, they would find the lodging provisions at Arnoldsburg, West Virginia, rather primitive. There aren't any hotels that I know of in Arnoldsburg, I, unless I've missed one. Is that right? Oh. Pending, huh? That's all right. I didn't know that. But Bethlehem, they didn't have a great amount of accommodation for travelers. Their, their accommodation for travelers were primitive. In fact, in those days, the custom was that travelers took their food with them. And so when they got there, the innkeeper provided the fodder for the animals and provided a fire for them to cook their food with. It's not like today where we go out to a restaurant. Very primitive. Now, one thing I want to clarify. The world with its many nativity sets pictured out around always pictures the birth of Jesus as a beautiful sight to see. Mary, this young girl, I would say, 13 to 16, somewhere like that, I'd say she probably wept that night. And I'm going to say this also, I believe that Joseph probably wept just as much as Mary did. I, I'm going to explain something to you. I, I remember when my sons were born, and I did not go in to see my sons born. I, I've always wished now that I had. But the length of time that I was in there, when I saw my wife in labor, I couldn't stand it for the amount of time I saw 
her and that she was in labor. But I couldn't stand to see her in pain. And I imagine Joseph was the same way, seeing his young wife in pain. Now, I have been around a barnyard or two, and in winter time, in the rainy season or whatever, I've always found barnyards not a pleasant place. They're not sanitary like the world. They always have these little nice, beautiful nativity sets and so on. That's not the way it was. The Lord was born in a stinking, dirty barnyard. And so I believe that, that Joseph cried because of the situation there and that being born in that stinking barnyard. I believe he cried, or, you know, he was probably cried as much because of their poverty, their humiliation. The people's indifference didn't have room for a pregnant woman about to deliver a baby in the end. And people are just the same today. They don't have any room in their hearts for Jesus. They're totally indifferent to Jesus. I believe it. he may have gotten pretty frustrated because of the sense of utter helplessness that he felt. And I'll say this too, and I, I'm, I'm speaking as a man, I believe that you know men are pretty much the same as they are. I believe he loved his wife, I believe he, he loved the child that was going to be the Christ child. And I believe, you know, that night when the baby was born in a stinking barnyard and had to be put in a manger and wrapped with dirty work clothes, these little swaddling clothes, I felt he felt ashamed of not being able to provide for his wife and his children. I'll tell you what, man, if he's worth salt at all, if he's worth anything, will get, he'll either cry or curse because he can't provide for his family if he's worth anything. I believe that Joseph, Joseph probably felt that way. Now, if you're going, like the world, to imagine that the Creator was born in this freshly swept country stable, you miss the point. Jesus, it, this thing's scandalous. He was born in the odor of all those animals and the manure and the straw. Made a contemptible bouquet for our Lord. And I want you to understand about the Incarnation. It was a giant leap downward. He uh, was born and all that. I wondered, why was he born that way? And I have concluded one thing. Why was he born in all that filth and that slime? Why? He had to come to our level. Because we're the ones that are in the filth and the slime called sin. He had to come down to our level. Amen. Of course, Luke finishes the story. And when... <laughs> I, I, you know, they have this, so, when you understand the Bible and the customs of those days, she wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and they make these nice little clean, beautiful rags, you know, angel-like type materials in the, in, in the nativity and so on. Those were work rags she wrapped him in. And it was uh, the custom, of, there was a square piece of cloth, and there was this long piece, this long strips. And, and, and she would wrap his arms and his legs. After she'd wrap him with a square piece first, she would then wrap his legs and his arms. Actually, kind of looked like a mummy when, when it was all wrapped up and done. So Jesus enters this world not as a prince, but as a pauper. In other words, he had to get down on our level. We're the pauper. He came to save us. We need to see ourselves as God sees us. Augustine said of this, the Lord, you know, the Lord didn't say anything because he's just a little baby, but says unspeakably, being the, he's still the creator, says unspeakably wise, 
He is wisely speechless. Lancelot Andrews, a man who no one's ever heard of him, but he did a lot of the writing for the King James Version of the Bible, particularly the English, spoke of Jesus as says, the word, he was the word without a word that night as a baby. And I want you to understand the wonder of it. The omnipotent, all-powerful God was born. In a, now, you tell me right now, if, if you think you can comprehend the, the birth of Jesus and how God was made flesh, if you think you can understand that, then, then I'm glad. But I, I, don't, I say that no one has ever been able to understand how God came in the flesh and was man and God at the same time. In the book of Timothy, Paul says it this way, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. And so it's called the hypostasis. It's called the, the, uh, the union between uh, human flesh and godliness. We can't comprehend that. God doesn't say, I want you to understand it. God says what? I want you to believe it. Why did he come that way? Because he had the divine, divine sympathy for us, knowing that we were down in the filth and the slime of sin. He understands, you know, today, our society, and this is the way we feel, uh, everybody, in all their jobs. We feel we're in so much stress today, we say, no one really knows what I'm going through. Don't we feel that way? No one really understands my situation. But that's not true. The Lord Jesus knows our situation. He became flesh. Had that divine sympathy that for us to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. That's why the wonderful scripture in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15. The Bible says this. It says... For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. That was the purpose of the incarnation, to understand, well, he understood, uh, to, to have a bridge between man and God, but to really know and, uh, to what, what we go through and to comprehend all those things. He did that for us lived that perfect life. Now, he, he moves through this story quickly. <laughs> the Bible doesn't waste any time. And he goes out to these shepherds. I find that very interesting. Jesus did not, when he was born, he was not born in the temple before the high priest and all the magnificent temple, which was, by the way, Herod's temple was, was considered a wonder of the world. He did not appear before the self right you know, be born among the self righteous Sadducees and Pharisees. He was born of all places. The first people to see him were the shepherds. Let me tell you something. God comes to the needy and the poor in spirit. By the way, did you know that the Shepherds were <clears throat> despised by the so-called good people of society. That's the way it is in a lot of churches, you know. They have the good people and then there's the sinners. Truth is, none of us are good. Amen. In the Mishnah, the Jewish writings, the, uh, the shepherds were regarded on the level of thieves. They had a band on them. They weren't even supposed to be in the presence of the good, self-righteous people. And here they were the ones, and now when they were tending, a lot of scholars believe where it says they were tending their flocks and so on, these were the flocks where, you know, they would make animal sacrifices for the temple. They were a necessary part. I mean, uh, the temple could not go on without those shepherds there tending to those flocks, making sure that they weren't harmed. They had to be spotless 
animals for the sacrifice. They were an important part of the equation, but they were looked down upon. A lot of churches do that today. And we have I mean, all these people, we say, you know, if we're not careful, we'll be like those Pharisees and Sadducees and look down upon people, and they're an important part of the equation. They're part of that whosoever will, aren't they? So you see, God comes to those who sense their need. You know, Jesus is the surrogate for us. And of course the angels occur and all that great multitude. Now let me say, that's a great multitude. That, I mean, that's more than 2,000. That's more. I believe it's an uncountable number. Job referred to them in Job 38 and 7 about when all the stars... The, uh, the sons of the morning sang together and so on. But I say to you that humans have it better than angels do because the Lord took upon our nature and died for us. And this story about the Lord coming and taking on the nature and, and, and being our surrogate and our sacrifice, we ought to sing year-round. We, we really ought to. Uh, in Hebrews 2.14, the Bible says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that hath the power of death, that is, the devil. So, he didn't take on the nature of angels. He took on our nature. That's how much he loved us. We have it really better than angels. We ought to sing about that year round. Now, the effect is this. And I want you to understand it's, the world needs to know they hear, it's not enough to hear about Jesus it's not enough to just peek into the manger once a year at Christmas time Luke is saying that Caesar Augustus is not the savior the real savior was born in Bethlehem you know what for people to be saved, the real Savior must be born in their heart. He must come into their heart, just like he came into Bethlehem. The world is trying to take Christ out of Christmas. Did you know that? I uh, read about a teacher in California the principal said, you cannot use the term Christmas in the classroom because it's too much related to Jesus Christ. There was this substitute teacher in Florida. I marvel about this. And some first graders, I was surprised she said it, but she told them that, you know, it's moms and dads that buy the presents at Christmas time. There's no such thing as a Santa Claus. She told them that, those little first graders. Of course, a lot of parents teach about Santa Claus, you know, and so on. So they got some guy dressed up like a Santa Claus, and he came in and said, I'm the real thing. I had, Santa Claus is real, and I'm the real thing. Thought those little kids believe that. Made that substitute teacher, the Board of Education, did apologize to the first graders to tell them that there was no Santa Claus. Now, one of these days, those little first graders are going to grow up and find out that the man dressed up like a Santa Claus was a lie. The Board of Education lied to them. Uh, the teacher lied to them. The sub only one that told them the truth was that substitute teacher. And they'll find out, they'll say, well, you know, Santa Claus is not real. I've never seen Santa Claus. But you know what? I've never seen Jesus either. So how do I know that's true? See? The fact is, there are more and more people now trying to say that this whole thing about Jesus and his birth is a myth. Let me give you a little history. You know, there were a number of people, a number of apostles. You know, Isaiah looked for the day that when uh, this baby would be born, when he prophesied of this coming Messiah. Did you know that he was sawn in half for his faith? Tradition says they sawed him in half. 
The only one I have Bible for is James the Greater. The rest of this comes from traditional history. But let's assume that there, this is true. Well, I've got one, that, another one I know is a historical fact. Matthew is believed died in Ethiopia from a sword wound for preaching the gospel about this little baby. Mark was in Alexandria, Egypt, and for preaching the gospel they attached him to a horse's harness and drug him through the streets of Alexandria until he died. Luke was in Greece having, having preached a great message uh, about this Savior that was born in Bethlehem, this Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior. They hung him. John, John faced martyrdom. They dropped him, in, in Rome, they dropped him into a, a vat of boiling oil, but miraculously he lived. Then they put him in the salt mines of Patmos, thinking he would die there, went on to become the bishop of Edessa in Turkey, and he's the only one to die a natural death. Peter died on an X-shaped cross, saying he was not worthy to die in the manner that his Savior died and requested to be crucified upside down. And as he went to the cross, Tadrician says that he kept saying, none but Christ, none but Christ. James the Just, there were two apostles called James, and so there's taught differently. You know, one's called James the Just and one's called James the Greater. James the Just was taken to the top of a temple and dropped a hundred foot off the edge of the pinnacle of a temple. And then they found out that he had survived the fall so they proceeded to beat him to death with a fuller's club for preaching and standing for this little baby that was born. James the Greater was the first martyr. He's found in the book of Acts and he was beheaded for standing for the truth of this little baby. According to tradition, a Roman soldier was so amazed at his preaching at his trial and as a defense at the trial, when he went to be hung himself, I mean, to be beheaded, when he kneeled down to be beheaded, a Roman soldier accepted Christ and kneeled down beside him and said, I'll die for Christ too. Bartholomew, also called Nathaniel, died in Turkey in an area of what we today call Armenia. Flayed to death by whips. Andrew, also crucified on an X cross, beaten by seven soldiers before he got to the cross in Patmos, Greece. Thomas is believed to have died in India from a spear. Jude, the brother of Jesus, we said that, that Mary had children after the virgin birth. Remember now, Jude never believed in, to, uh, in his brother Jesus as the Messiah until after the resurrection. He was killed by arrows. And would, none of these people I'm telling you about would ever, you know, they were given the opportunity to renounce your faith in this baby that was born, the one that's called the Messiah. They would never renounce their faith in Jesus. Matthias, the one who took the place of Judas in the book of Acts, was stoned and then later beheaded, given the opportunity to deny Christ. Bartimaeus, one we studied about in that book of Acts, stoned death at Salonica. Paul was beheaded in Rome. And of course that finishes up the apostles. But Polycarp, one of those great followers in the early church who had been around all those men, at 86 years of age they burned him alive in Smyrna in an amphitheater in front of a whole audience. Given the opportunity to now, you may renounce this baby this Christ and so on and I'll die I'll die for him now let me ask you this question if that was a myth and known to be a lie do men willingly die die for what they know to be a, a lie they don't do that do they they die for something that they're that what they believe in 
And I say to you that we need to believe in Jesus. Because it, he made this giant step downward from the divine God to our level to pick us up, uh, up out of that terrible, filthy situation called sin in our life. We owe him so much, don't we? Amen. We can never pay him back. But one thing we can give him at this time of year is glory. At this time of year, I ask you to do one thing. Yes, spend time with your family, love your family, enjoy one another, but don't leave Jesus out of the season. Thank you for your patience.